Hello, and welcome to Grief Tending. This podcast series is aimed at supporting anyone who's in a caregiving role to someone who is or will be grieving. These conversations uh, aim to uh, develop our collective capacity to be alongside grief in supportive ways. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on whose unceded land these interviews are recorded, the Turrbal and Yagara people, to recognize their ongoing connection to land, waters, and culture, and to acknowledge elders past, present, and emerging. This episode of Grief Tending sits in the health professional stream and is a conversation with Dr. Mary Brooksbank. Um, it's uh, a really rich and reflective conversation. Mary is looking back on, on an extensive um, career of practice, you know, both in palliative care and in medicine as a surgeon. Um, so hopefully Mary's biography, which I'll read now, will give some context to, um, to the topics we speak about. So Mary grew up in Melbourne and trained in medicine at the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital in the 1960s. After her initial years of clinical training, she decided to pursue a career in surgery and took up a training position at the Birmingham Accident Hospital in England. With no openings in the trauma units, she ended up in Burns, which she found to be a challenging but fascinating speciality. Then a move back to Melbourne to complete her surgical training, where Mary was one of the few experts in the management of Burns patients. After a further year of plastic surgery and Burns training in Perth, her career was eventually derailed by a move to Adelaide to marry her husband. Together they travelled overseas to Canada, the UK and America, while her husband completed his neurosurgical training and Mary had the first two of their three children. But on return to Adelaide, there were still no openings in Burns as a specialty. Meanwhile, in the late 1980s, oncologists at the Royal Adelaide Hospital were looking for a hospice option for their patients at the end of life and negotiated with nearby Mary Potter Hospice to create a joint staffing arrangement. This all came at an entirely serendipitous time for our guest today. Mary was recruited to the team and, learning on the job, consulted at the Royal Adelaide Hospital looking after patients there and then also at the Mary Potter Hospice and also supported GPs in her region when they needed help with home visits. Eventually, when she became director of the Central Adelaide Palliative Care Service a few years later, Mary would visit Darwin, Broken Hill and all the north, northwest regional and remote South Australia on various outreach programs. While doing all of this, Mary was also teaching in every year of a six-year medical course at the University of Adelaide. And since retirement, Mary has chaired Palliative Care South Australia and is now the chair of GriefLink. Uh, she's on their management committee. And we'll put links to both of those organisations um, in, uh, in the episode today. So it was a real honour to, to speak with Mary as she reflected back um, on her career in medicine and specifically on the way in which the presence of grief in medicine uh, has shifted and changed and her perspective on the ways in which that has changed um, during you know more than 30 years of of practice um, you know this this idea in healthcare more broadly specifically outside of palliative care of death being viewed as a failure um, and just how impactful that was, um, you know, particularly in the in the 1980s and 1990s, the suffering that, that she witnessed, you know, other physicians and, and people encounter, um, and also this this idea, you know, palliative care in the time when 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 Mary was practicing that, you know, in the kind of late 80s and early 90s, um, there was this. Typically, people would reach palliative care quite a lot later, a lot closer to the end of, of their lives. So there's often this phrase in palliative care about upstreaming care. How can we move move care upstream and become in, involved in care earlier, earlier in the trajectory of someone's illness? And it struck me that the conversation also paralleled this in terms of upstreaming grief that rather than only recognizing the presence of grief at death or you know, after someone has died, that carrying that with us through our practice, through recognition of our own mortality, you know, especially as health professionals, 
caring for people who are dying as someone who will also experience illness, the death of those we love, and then eventually our own deaths as well. And that rather than that being, um, you know, depressing or kind of morbid statement, that actually that can deepen the capacity for connection and professional care. So um, yeah, I really appreciated this, this conversation with Mary and especially her willingness and openness to share with, um, with honesty and vulnerability about her own um, you know, health experiences and, and how, how those continue to impact her encounters while caring for others. Um, so whether you are a health professional who has been practicing you know, in medicine or, or within palliative care, or whether you're someone who's just starting out, I, I feel like this is a really important conversation as we look back to the elders and those in the lineage of, of palliative and hospice care um, and to be reminded and to reflect on some of the things that really sit at the heart of um, of hospice. Um, and one of those, I think, we, we kind of close the conversation by speaking about the tension, I think, that can exist when, when conversations about professional boundaries become one-sided and become somewhat clinical and sterilized and potentially risk moving or removing the need for presence of, of being fully human. It's possible to be fully human and, and fully professional at the same time. And that was sort of distilled into this, this beautiful reflection on the resonance of tears and how powerful, you know, in that space beyond words, how powerful those can be. Um, so yes, I, I hope that you enjoy and find something helpful in this conversation uh, with, uh, with Mary. Thank you. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Grief Tending. Thank, thank you, Adam. Yes. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you, you know, to reflect back on, you know, your career in, in medicine as a surgeon, um, as a medical director, and also an educator. You began your practice in a very different world to, to the one we see today. Um, this was a, a time of pre-internet before um you know, palliative care even emerged formally as a, as a sort of subspecialty in Australia. This is the 1980s. And, um, you know, you've also spoken around, it was an even more patriarchal kind of, you know, um, medicine, medicine system than, than we see today. You experienced a number of, you know, times of misogyny, discrimination, things like this. So it's just a very different time. And I wonder, you know, as we were talking around um, the extent of that, you know, different areas you've practiced in, but also the, the, the length of time. I wondered if you could share with us in relation to grief, the way in which you've seen that change within, within your professional practice um, and throughout the course of your career. Right. Well, I, I mean, obviously in my early medical career, um, when I decided I wanted to be a surgeon and specifically a trauma surgeon, um, I uh, ended up working in the burns unit in Birmingham Accident Hospital and uh, I, I think um, that was, a, I, I've been very lucky that I worked always with compassionate, sensitive men, always men, there were no women surgeons around in those days. Um, and, and through that experience in burns where you know, it's a terrible injury and it's a very long road to recovery. And so it's it's not just the sort of medical things you're doing for people. There's a, there really needs to be a human connection to, to give people the, the courage and the strength to keep going forward. Um, so although grief wasn't discussed in any way in those days, um, I, I, there was just this sort of silent recognition that it was around and you kind of dealt with it. Um, and uh, when I was, when I did change careers, which wasn't entirely by choice, but I don't regret now at all, my my uh, boss from Birmingham wrote and said, well, wasn't Burns a great preparation for life? And I, and I, I think that was true. 
the just the accepting that death came um, as as part of the life cycle, and sometimes it came suddenly and unexpectedly and unfairly, but but one had to accept it, and and that um, I think that was one of the biggest things I learned. And so when when I started working in palliative care, we I had uh, hospice beds. We had a hospice, but we also worked in the teaching hospital, um, and we had beds there as well, which which I thought was incredibly important. It tried to put us on sort of equal footing. We were not something out there that we took people away to look after them. We we looked after them in the hospital, often in their own wards in a consult team, and um, again. So grief really wasn't a topic. We, I'm walk, you know, I was very new to this. I was walking around the hospital wards with a list of how to control symptoms in my pocket. Um, so, so grief was sort of the last thing, in a sense, on, on my mind. But um, and and I think I, I mentioned to you that it really didn't come up in in literature or research very much. Although looking back in the early nineties, there was a growing you know, a- academic um, and uh, body of work around grief. But when when I came to do palliative care grand rounds at the Royal Adelaide, it was that's a very scary thing. Um, it's full of very knowledgeable physicians, and he was I as a surgeon, and I thought, no, I, I can't really try and teach them medicine. So I used a, a quote as my heading, and and. People had said this to me over and over again. Um, I don't know how you do what you do. And I, I, I tried to sort of tease this apart and particularly looking at the faces of people who were saying to me, it, it was because they had this sense of failure that, that they hadn't been able to change the course of events um, for a particular patient. So it, it was it, that was one of the big things. And I found a paper that was written in 1993 uh, in France by a professor of oncology who surveyed a, a group of GPs. And, and interesting, most of them were men, um, sort of around their 40s was the cohort. And it was called The Suffering of the Doctor Linked to the Death of a Patient. And um, the the... When, when people were asked how they felt, um, between eight, was, the figures were staggering, 80 to 90% for these. They felt sadness, they felt helplessness, and they felt a failure. Mm. And then sort of down the list, at least 50% were confronted by their own mortality. And, and I, I just think that that probably that sense of failure and that and the sense of your own mortality and not having really dealt with that was the obstacle for people confronting dying patients and 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 dealing with the grief that it generated. Um, so, so by that you mean by having not faced that somehow in the, in themselves in or in their own lives? Yeah, in themselves. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, I'm, and I'm really not quite sure where I faced it, but. Perhaps, perhaps it was um, as a medical student. I mean, I had very little experience of death in my own life. Um, and uh, as a medical student, once I had access to the hospital uh, in our clinical years, my mother contacted me to say that this woman who'd been really important in our community um, was had been taken to hospital and could I find out what was happening? So it was, I remember going into this dark ward and there she was on a ventilator. We don't ventilate people in wards anymore either. Um, and the registrar who was was looking after her came in after me and I, I asked what was happening and she, she explained what they had found, they'd had to operate on her and that she wasn't going to survive and that they would be stopping the ventilator very soon. And she was very gentle, very kind woman. Um, she actually ended up being a palliative care doctor many years later. Um, but I had to convey that back to my mother and and experience because I, I didn't feel quite so close to it. It was a shock. 
and and I certainly felt something. But then t- taking that back to my mother and and knowing that this was going to ripple through the community, um, I, I guess I just that, uh, that's that's perhaps the only concrete thing I can pick up um, in in looking back on on how I started to think about death and grief. Um, yeah, and I, you know that makes me think actually as you as you say that. Oftentimes, I find people will will field this question. You know, when you're working in palliative care, people ask as if there is necessarily a definitive moment, and 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 for some there is. You know, it's it's the death of someone very significant in their own life or something like this. Um, and I think about you know discussions that have that, you know other staff at the hospice here have had. It's sort of sometimes quite quite a bit more subtle and cumulative the ways in which people not only find their way to this work but also find their relationship with exploring mortality, I think. Yes, yes. Well, certainly, um, you know, when I tried to answer the question, I don't know how you do what you do, um, there were other elements to it. Um, I, When I became involved with somebody's care in palliative care, Again, I suppose we were seeing people a little bit later in those early years than than perhaps we might do now. We kept talking about going upstream and how much more we could have done if we'd been there a bit earlier. But, um, you know, the the, the die was cast. Um, there, there really hadn't been anything's missed. You know, the person that had the best possible care and was dying now of an inevitable disease progression. So there wasn't any sense of failure unless there had been a failure. And and then, then I took that very hard. I, I used to get if, if somebody hadn't been neglectful or, or missed something. But but it you it wasn't complicated in any way by that. So so the task was to make this dying as comfortable and as as um, and and you know and the, I mean we still do we're doing living as well you know people were living at home um, people were living in the hospice for a bit longer than perhaps they did now people were going home from the hospice which people when the first people started doing that after managing their symptoms they were quite shocked they thought it was a very much a one way um, uh, process but no so so it. it, it there wasn't guilt or anything like that mixed up in it, um, and I and I think that that was the different one of the differences. I think the other difference was that although I was dealing with death all the time, I was doing it within a team, and uh, you know we we um, it was a very small medical team, but the but the nurses were absolutely fabulous, um, and uh, I, I learned. I, you know, when I started palliative care, I learned so much from the nurses who had been doing it for some years before I came on the scene. And uh, so we, we didn't particularly do formal debriefing. Um, there were times when at different over different years there would be a social worker who would do that to some extent, but it, it was it was done informally. And I also used to think the nursing handover was a really important point for the nurses and, and sometimes I'd join in that because that was a chance to talk about what had happened. And, and then, of course, we had our team meetings as well where we could talk about what had happened and, um, and, and just deal with it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can hear you sort of naming it, it, the presence of grief but in a more subtle way. You yeah. know, like you said, when you worked, when you worked in Burns, it was not spoken about but it was in some way acknowledged that it was there and then even though sometimes maybe the formal debrief when the situation would have called for it that really in the day-to-day that people were tending to those things but you've you've also spoken about how you know you were surprised I think when you you sort of were um um or in more of a formal educative role um of going out you shared a you know a story of going out to to um to share a presentation with some staff where you thought you were going to talk about about medicine, but actually something different was was in the, yeah, well, in the well actually that was that was an amazing trip 
that took me from, um, it, I mean, we were obviously in South Australia, yeah, Adelaide-based, but we had a strong relationship with Broken Hill in New South Wales and they got, so we would discuss patients and things like that and um, join, they'd join our sort of telehealth conferences and things. So they got funding for me to go up there and teach and I, I thought that was the end of story but it turned out that it was the entire Far West Area Health Service, which is in a very narrow western band of New South Wales, starting near the Queensland border, ending with, on the Victorian border. And, and the contract was that I had to do it twice in a year and spend two nights in each of a number of towns. And uh, so I, I did go with my symptom control package the first time. And, and as usual, I would tell stories and then they would tell me stories. So it was a very mixed audience. Um, the, uh, a lot of nurses, carers, doctors struggled to get away and sometimes I had to do extra sessions with them. But as the stories came out, you could see the, the tears just coming to people's eyes as they retold these stories. And I thought, no, hang on, we, we have to talk about this. So I, I went back. So the next time I went back, I, I, I think I prepared some oncology bits as well because it was a whole day of... But, but I, I gave a talk on grief. And it was to try and give them a, a sort of framework about where the thinking was around grief at the moment um, and, uh, you know, some of the different sort of cultural practices and things like that. And there were just some amazing coincidences at the time because when I talked to them about understanding their feelings and, and being in touch with their feelings and then how that can translate to sort of helping somebody through, uh, supporting somebody through their grief, one of, one of the things that I, I mentioned was, was finding meaning. Uh, in, and, and, I mean, you can't find it if it's not there, some deaths. But, but driving up to, on the second trip, there were two radio uh, broadcasts, about one about a, a teenage girl who had died at a rock concert just then, just at that time, and her father was interviewed and he explained that this is, was her greatest love in her life and so for him her, her death had some meaning and he obviously was coping reasonably well for this terrible, terrible tragedy. Mm. And then, then not long after that there was another uh, teenage boy who was doing work experience with the rubbish truck the council and the rubbish truck fell off it and got run over and killed, and the the anger and the meaninglessness you could just see how difficult that that trajectory of that grief was going to be. So I I had those stories to share with them as well. You know, just just that that if if I mean I, I guess it boils down to to how. You, the sort of world view as to, as to whether, um, you know, someone's out to get you or whether this is just something that's come up naturally. And uh, maybe we can talk about that a little bit later in, in relation to my my health issues. But there was a quote that I used and I, I was just, because I think it can be very, when you're talking about grief, it, it would be easy to fall into the trap that this speaker did. <clears throat> so this is out of one of the grief uh, books, but it's a it's it's so it's a quote, and I know people think you ought to get over things, but I don't see anything to get over. It's part of me. It's part of what I am. This thing about getting over it, I really resent. We went up to a conference, and they had a speaker there who was a professional, got no children of her own, but she knew everything. And she told you how long it would be before you got over it and she told you the stages of what would happen in that. I really wanted to get up and wring her neck, to be honest. I found it really, really objectionable. So I was, I was sort of hoping that that message would, would get through and uh, that 
you know, people wouldn't try and teach people grief. It's just supporting people, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, this this has come up in a number of episodes that that undoubtedly there are some helpful principles or, you know, kind of scaffolding that can be there, mm. but really um, it's the human encounter with the reality, the felt reality, the embodied reality of loss that really enables people to, I wouldn't say, you know, I'm hesitant to say understand because different types of death and different griefs are so different, but to have some insight or to have some idea beyond that of a very tightly packaged number of steps model, something like this, Um, you know, and I suppose thinking about that quote, you you also shared one where we were discussing from, um, you know, pioneering palliative care physician, Eric Eric Cassell, um, that you can't work in palliative care without experiencing grief yourself. And, you know, I wondered if you would maybe share with us, you know, as a medical professional, you've, you've obviously, you know, um, cared for many people as they were dying, worked with many people who were grieving in that process. Um, and also through that, you know, you were, you were reflecting on the challenges that doctors in that French article were experiencing where they maybe had not reflected or come to terms with their own mortality. So, I mean, how have those things intersected in, in your own life? Yeah, well, <clears throat> the, the first time I met Eric Cassell was in 1998 and we brought him out to Adelaide for a conference uh, which was just called Suffering. And he'd written a lot about suffering and uh, um, rather than just sort of symptom control stuff. So he gave a lecture, and I don't really remember much of the content of that lecture, but he kept saying, remember you're working, remember you're working. So so that really stuck in my head. And then he wrote something for for our palliative care newsletter, and he explained what he meant about having to experience grief uh, in palliative care. And he said that because he did it sort of as a lone physician. He he came from public health and found he was working more and more at the end of life. And uh, um, and he, he um, tried to hold that pain away of losing patients, of sharing their grief, the family's grief. And he said it wasn't, and, and it, it, that hurt him. And once he let it in, once he let him have the feel you know, himself feel what he needed to feel in that situation, um, he felt better. And but remember, you're working, and and that's that's the um, was the kind of underlying thing. And I, I I think in terms of the grief that I experienced during palliative care. There were moments where there was strong identification with situations in my life, like the death of my father um, from prostate cancer, and everybody knew I was a little bit vulnerable whenever I had a middle-aged to elderly man with dying of prostate cancer. And But we also were able to articulate it. One of the doctors who was on call one night rang me and said, I can't do this admission, and it turned out it was a teenager the same age as his son. Um, you know, we 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 rec- had to recognise that there were points where we did identify, and it became personal. Uh, and I, I I know we talked about this uh, before was was taking grief home um, when it when it was personal. I lived two hundred metres from the hospice by accident. So there was no time between, um, you know, leaving work and getting home to to deal with something that had impacted personally. And, uh, I, and I remember it was a Saturday morning when our beloved scoutmaster died and I was on, on duty and uh, so obviously had to deal with it. And, uh, um, and I came home and all my children were out, but... We had a, a, um, a an exchange student from Germany, and and she did what my children used to do. They just hugged me while I cried, and they knew it wasn't 
their grief. They didn't have to do anything but just give me that little bit of love. And now she's a doctor back in Germany, so also a surgeon, which is just wonderful. But, yeah, so I, I um, uh, you know, I can remember my daughter when she was quite young. She she um, has been involved with, with really the, my hospice career. That's all she knew. And, uh, you know, if I was looking a bit down, she said, Mummy, are you a bit sad? Did somebody die today? Um, you know, it was, it was really, really wonderful. And um, I, I mean, I'm not sure that every family could cope with that, but, but we, talking to other colleagues, we, we thought at some stage there might be a paper about the children of palliative care uh, doctors who, who have learnt that, that grief is a part of life, you know, and as well, and, uh, and that, that uh, it needs to be dealt with, looked after, um, that sort of thing. The, uh, I think I, I sort of touched briefly before on the, my own brush with mortality, um, which came sort of, sort of it, after, after most of the events that I've talked about. Um, and I, I, I hadn't linked this until I'd been thinking about it uh, before we talked today, that there was a communication skills workshop for oncologists that was run sometime in the early 2000s, I, I suspect. And because they didn't seem to know how to teach palliative care doctors communication because they thought they knew it all anyway. I mean, the, the communication teachers thought we... So I, but I was allowed to join in and, and I had to role play with a senior oncologist, a patient being given the news of breast cancer. And, and it was such a profound experience when, when the teacher said he wanted us to do it again in a, and, and we, we looked at each other and said, no, we can't do that again. You know, it was, it was, so then a few years later, I find myself on, again on a Saturday morning when my biopsy results came through, sitting on the couch with a breast surgeon beside me holding my hand, my husband sitting across the room in a state of shock um, and being given the same diagnosis. So it, it uh, so I cried and, and of course, <coughs> we all sort of shed tears at the news, but I, I didn't ever feel that it was out of place. I mean, why should I not be one of the people who gets breast cancer? Um, so I, it was it was sort of just how do we get through this? And, and we obviously did. <clears throat> but there's another little postscript to that. And uh, because I, I spent most of that year having treatments of one sort or another, and started coming back to work just as my mother entered her dying weeks. And she died on Christmas Day on that year. And I, I had to come back to work because everybody had worn out. I'd worn out all my leave. I'd worn out all my colleagues. And I came back to the hospice. And obviously the word had got around and I had my patients in the hospice looking out for me, you know, trying to be sure I was okay before I dealt with them being okay. It, was, it really was sort of magic that that, that that sort of human connection just doesn't doesn't go away. It's uh, you need to treasure that. Mm. That's so powerful. I mean, I mean, thank you for sharing so much from your own experience. But especially when you you just finished there by talking, I just I feel so moved. It's like the the boundary between physician and patient kind of melts yeah. for a split second or, or even switches yeah. around. You know? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it really encapsulates, I think, um, yeah. while both people are still in their, you know, capital letter roles of doctor and patient, yeah. there's there's some other, some other um, happening in those moments yeah. as well, possible. I, th I think, you know, I, you know, if you go back to Cicely Saunders, <clears throat> and her the, the story about how she got into setting up St Christopher's and everything and and um, and I mean it f certainly it was a man who fell in love with her and mutual love in this nursing home scenario uh, 
but they talked about a better way of looking after people who were dying and things like that. But And he, he said to her, you know, I, I want what is in your heart and unless you're prepared to give some of that, then I don't think you can truly deliver um, palliative care. I, 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 I think that was the starting point and, and for me that was, that was the ongoing point. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, I think that's a beautiful way to, to frame it, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, as, as we're talking today, Mary, uh, thank you for sharing, you know, your reflections as you look back on um, on your career and also on your on your own life. And I wonder, I suppose, I wanted to ask you, and you've already shared a number of these, I think, particularly in that last statement around, you know, well, well both as Eric herself said, sort of let it in, you know, <laughs> let the feelings in. And it struck me sort of like we let them let them in, let them visit. They don't have to become, you know, full term, long term residents <laughs> in your heart, but let them in. But, you know, maybe as you think around if there's people listening to this who are either starting out in a you know career in palliative care um, or thinking about it, maybe there are some students or mm. who knows who will see these or listen to these. Um, so could you share maybe some, some other thoughts around some practice wisdom or, or principles of things that have been particularly helpful for you that you may have learnt along the way rather than heard explicitly in the classroom. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I hear a lot about boundaries these days and uh, and I think you've just articulated that, that the boundary can get a bit blurring uh, um, and uh, but... But it's somewhere it's it is still there. You know, you are the professional and you're not going to be any use unless you can remember that. But but that doesn't let stop the you know the human connection happening as well. Um, and uh, I, I I think you know, people used to say it's so depressing, but it's sad, but it's not depressing. And and I think in you know in palliative care, I met such wonderful people. It was extraordinary how quickly you could connect with people who are sort of vulnerable at, at, at that moment in their lives. And it might only be a matter of days and, and still there was a, a connection that, that was important um, for the family, for, for, for them. And uh, but, but, I mean, obviously you can't... <coughs> Carry the burden of sort of personal grief all the time. I, I, I used to find that that uh, my letting go moment was when I signed the death certificate. Did the, I, I, and unless there was some other personal connection, um, and it's it's. Uh, I recognise that in a big city that's okay. In in country regional areas where where the, the doctor or nurses or anybody involved in the care of a person, it will be their neighbour or the person just down the street, someone they've grown up with, gone to school with. So so that's really difficult. And I, I remember one night when the, the GPs in Burke couldn't make it to my lecture, so I met them late in the hospital. And this young guy said to me, you know, we were taught all this stuff about empathy, but no one told us what to do with it. Uh, <laughs> afterwards and you know so I think I think you know there are people do need to have ways of processing what's happened and um, there's been a big discussion recently about going to funerals um, I went to very few funerals because I was just so busy but if that it I think the only thing about going to a funeral is to know why you're going is it because the family felt really leaned on you, felt important, you know, that that, that was a connection that, that you felt you needed to follow through one more step? Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's about knowing what you, how it's affecting you, how, it's, how you're feeling. Um, but on, and on the other side, I, you know, I just think it was such a rewarding 
career to have in those last 20 years. Um, you know, it was really enriching. I, I think I think it made me a better person. Um, I, I, I would, I mean, even if it was just incorporating what people have learnt about palliative care into their own practice. Mm. You know, I, I, um, we used to give a Mary Potter medal to the students in, for an essay in one of the years. And I met one of those young men um, a few years later watching the sunset over Ayers Rock. And he was a bit embarrassed because he'd said he wanted to do palliative care and, and, and he was doing paediatric surgery. And I said, no, no. you know. And he said, it, but it was so good, that experience, to be able to take that into the discussions with families. So so I, I think, I th- you know, it's it's an extraordinary life experience. Um, and uh, I, but but may not but it may not be for everyone you know I think but but I think everybody in medicine or working around medicine has to become as you know comfortable with the fact mm. that death happens um, it's confronting when you start out but it happens and we we need to do the best we can yeah that's it's very true and. You know, as you speak, I kind of, especially around the boundaries when you were speaking earlier, <clears throat> I think this idea of allowing the rigidity somewhat to dissolve and, and to have some osmosis. So maybe the boundaries are there, but things are still able to pass between the two. And um, I suppose as we close, I just, I really wanted you to share that um, that quote about crying, because I think tears are often, often for people, one of the triggers where they either lean in, pull away. Or just feel a, feel a low level freak out of what should I do? Where are the tissues? These kind of things, and just that that I don't know something about the the water in tears being this um, this uh, you know not metaphor, but thing that can melt, you know, yes. thing that can yes. melt and bring the humanity. Yes. So um, yeah, yes. it, it, it's probably a good way to sum up as we finish. Maybe if you could share that and any thoughts right. on that. Yes. So this, this was a 1993 Lancet art- article, Leslie Fallowfield said, too often doctors uh, act as though, as though one should react to, sorry, I start again. Too often doctors act as though one should react to crying as one does to hemorrhage stop it as soon as possible so <laughs> yeah. so perhaps people will uh, yeah be be a little bit more comfortable with letting the tears flow yeah. uh, on on both sides of the uh, yeah i i think i think being the professional i often had tears in my eyes but i never wept that that happened in the tea room with the nursing staff if it had to happen i th- yeah. think i think the to make the patient feel uncomfortable or the family feel uncomfortable with your tears. Tears in the eyes, I, I couldn't stop. Right, as a as kind of an echo or yeah, a mirror. Snicker, like a but not, yeah. not a, yes, yes. And, and, and I'm, I know somebody's written all about that too. So, uh, Yeah, absolutely. We often say to staff here, like, tears are very welcome, but, yeah, check in as to what's happening for you yes. and don't cry more than the family because that that's gets right. really awkward. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mary, thank you so much for, for your time and uh, all you've shared with us. I um, really, really appreciate it. Sure. And, um, no, thank you. Thank you. Be, be helpful for the next generation. Uh, yeah. you know, come, come yeah. Wish them all the luck. Yes.